Welcome to Locks, Blocks, and Snapshots, Maximizing Database Concurrency. Uh, my name is Bob Pusateri. Uh, very brief introduction. I have a lot of things going on, but probably the most important thing on this slide is my email address and my Twitter handle. Um, if you have any other questions that we're not able to address during this session, please feel free to drop me a line, and I'll show these again at the end. Uh, we do have a lot of material to cover, so I'm going to get right in and get started here. Uh, we're going to start off by talking about the basics of what concurrency is and why it matters. Um, and then we're going to dive into the meat of this session, which is really SQL Server's isolation levels, uh, how they work, what they do, and why they matter, how they can determine the performance and the correctness of your queries and, and why they're so important. And then at the very end, we'll have a very brief touch on the in-memory OLTP feature that kind of takes everything we talk in this session and throws it out the window for a completely different technology that has its own pluses and minuses. So what is concurrency? Um, concurrency is the ability for an operation to be broken up into to different parts that can be solved independently of each other. And then once we're solving things independently of each other, uh, we have a problem of maybe there's shared resources that need to be accessed at the same time by, by different um, operations. So th this works fine in most cases, but the more users and the more objects that are shared between them, we can start seeing problems and we can have limiting factors that appear. And these are where concurrency problems show up. Um, we're going to go back to computer science class for a brief moment. Um, if anyone here studied computer science, you may be familiar with what's known as the dining philosophers problem. Uh, this was a, a computer science problem proposed by Ezra Dijkstra, or Dijkstra, I, I don't speak Dutch, I don't know how to pronounce it, uh, but a famous problem proposed by him. He won the Turing Award, which is kind of like the Nobel Prize for computing. Um, and there's actually another prize named for him. But he came up with this problem to teach concurrency. And the idea was you had five philosophers sitting around a table, each had a bowl of spaghetti and a fork. Uh, but in order to eat, a philosopher needed two forks. And they could only pick up one fork at a time. And once they're done eating, they need to put both forks back on the table. And when a philosopher is not eating, they're thinking. Now, there's no right answer to this problem. There's multiple approaches to it and ways to solve it. But the idea is you want to make sure that each philosopher can eat and that none of them quite literally starve by not eating, by thinking too much. And there's problems that can come in with this. Like, what if everyone picks up one fork? Well, no one can acquire a second fork, so nobody can eat. So we need to have an algorithm that addresses this. Or what if there's a time limit? What if once you acquire the first fork, you have to acquire the second one within a certain period of time where you have to release that first fork. What if someone never gets to eat? They're thinking all the time. Uh, this, is, this is quite literally starvation and it's also referred to that in, in operating systems in a lot of times. And these are, this seems like a simple problem, but this is the exact same kind of problem we can have with databases. So if we were to take this problem, this dining philosopher's problem and change it and maybe call it now the database problem, we can, we can build a parallel very quickly. We would have a table, we would have instead of philosophers, just our users. Um, and our users are trying to access data. So we have, we have tables representing data. But in order to do that, they need to acquire locks, right? At least in a, in a pessimistic model. And then the, the overall constraint we have here is, of course, money, because databases and the technology are, are typically not cheap, especially with good know-how. Um, and this leads to very real problems we, we see every day in databases. And this is where concurrency conflicts come in, and these isolation levels can help mitigate these issues. Now, ANSI defines three different types of what are called preventable read phenomena, and these are called dirty reads, non-repeatable reads, and phantom reads. We'll get into these in a moment, what exactly they mean. You may have heard of them before. Uh, but what's important to note here at the bottom of the screen is that ANSI specifies what behaviors are allowed at each level, but not how to implement the solution. This is why you get, you get different solutions at different isolation levels, and we'll, we'll see that as we delve into what SQL Server does. There's also other issues of lost updates and deadlocks that we'll talk on briefly. The first idea is a dirty read. This is reading data that has not yet been committed. So you're, you're reading data and there's changes you are seeing that are still in flight and have yet to be committed that are being done by a different process, right? This can lead to a bunch of problems because you're reading data that hasn't really been fully committed to yet, right? And you can actually end up reading data multiple times or not at all, depending on the situation, uh, if you're allowing dirty reads. And commonly, the argument for, for dirty reads or read uncommitted or what's most commonly known as no lock in SQL Server is, well, well it's faster and, and it can be faster at times, but I would be more concerned with the fact that it can lead to incorrect results. 
you know, it's always easy to provide an incorrect result quickly. If any, any question you're asked, the number is 42, right? That's, that's just the answer. It's incorrect, but you wanted the answer quickly. Um, so the same kind of idea here. You gotta kind of weigh this out if you're going to allow dirty reads in your environment. The next one is non-repeatable reads, uh, which is also known as inconsistent analysis. And this is where you have multiple queries taking place in the same transaction, uh, but they actually can produce different results. Uh, this means that another transaction may have committed a change in between those reads and your isolation level is allowing those, those reads to occur. Maybe that's okay, maybe not. Again, this is a business decision. Uh, we also have phantom reads and phantom reads affect queries with, with a predicate or a where clause. And the idea here is that membership in your result set will change. So if you have multiple queries using the same predicate, using the same where clause in the same transaction, that return different results. This means that, that phantom rows have effectively been injected into your result set and are visible in your transaction. Is this good or bad? Again, it can depend, but it's something to think of. Um, there's the notion of what are called lost updates or an update conflict. And this is where you have simultaneous updates and one user's update overwrites another user's update. Uh, SQL Server does not allow this in any isolation level and we'll see why in just a moment when we talk about um, read uncommitted isolation level and how it prevents this. But what can happen if lost updates do occur is that it would appear as though the first update never happened. Again, this is not possible in SQL Server. And then we have deadlocks, which I'm assuming most are familiar with. And the idea with a deadlock is you have two or more processes or tasks blocking each other. Uh, each has acquired a lock and is waiting for a different lock that the other process has. And because you have this situation here, um, neither process will ever get the lock it needs and this could continue infinitely. Uh, fortunately, SQL Server has the ability to detect deadlocks and will choose a victim and resolve them. And as soon as that victim is rolled back, all its locks are released. Um, but deadlocks are, can be a very real problem as well. Now there's two general ways to address all these issues. Uh, there's pessimistic concurrency and optimistic concurrency. Uh, the older model is pessimistic. This is what was the only thing that was available before SQL Server 2005. And this is where conflict is expected between processes. So we're taking locks to prevent those conflicts. Uh, this is the classic model of readers blocking writers and writers blocking readers. And again, if you're using SQL Server 2000 or earlier, which hopefully you're not at this point, this was the only set of options available to you. When SQL Server 2005 came out, they introduced optimistic concurrency, which solves these problems in a different way. Um, it takes the optimistic approach. It's not expecting conflicts. It's, it's instead saying, yes, conflicts are possible, but hopefully not likely. Um, so we're going to use a version store and we're going to have less locking. Uh, not no locking, it's very important to point out there are still plenty of locks that exist in optimistic concurrency, but the idea is to reduce the amount of locks that are necessary uh, through the use of the version store and hopefully achieve better performance and results. So this is kind of the basics of concurrency. Um, and now we're ready for the meat of our presentation, which is diving into the specific isolation levels that SQL Server has. So what is an isolation level? Um, in short, it's something that determines how isolated your transaction is from the effects of any other transactions. As I said, there's pessimistic and optimistic concurrency models and there's isolation levels that go with each. Uh, you'll see here, there's, there's four different pessimistic isolation levels. There's read committed, read uncommitted, repeatable read and serializable. And then there's two optimistic isolation levels which are snapshot and read committed snapshot. Now, if you're not sure what isolation level you're using at any specific time, the easiest way to check is to run a command that is dbcc user options. And what this will return is this will go ahead and return a whole bunch of different settings for your connection. Um, and you'll see here at the bottom, there is a isolation level row that gets returned. Um, and in this case, the isolation level the connection was in was read committed. So that's what it's returning. Isolation levels, if you want to change them, they can be changed at either the connection or the query level. Um, they cannot be changed server-wide, that's very important to point out, and the default, the default default is read committed. So if you were to install an on-premises SQL Server today um, and just open it up and make no changes, 
you would end up in the recommitted isolation level. You can change your isolation levels at the connection level using the syntax on the screen. That's where you say set transaction isolation level and then pick one. Uh, but that only applies to the current connection or your current window on SSMS. So if you, if you set a transaction isolation level, that's localized to your connection at that point. Otherwise, new connections will default to recommitted or whatever your default happens to be. The other way to change it is through query hints uh, or table hints, and that changes it at the query level. This is the classic model of, you know, select from a table with no lock as the example here. You're, you're changing the isolation level at the query level and you're doing so with hints. Uh, and these are on a per table basis. So if you've ever written a query with no lock and you've joined multiple tables together, you've probably realized you have to specify with no lock uh, each time a table is mentioned to achieve that. Now, as I said before, pessimistic concurrency is the idea of using locking to prevent concurrency conflicts, right? It's kind of like if you're thinking of traffic, it would be like an intersection with a traffic light, right? We're going to use a traffic light and enforce, uh, hopefully enforce prevention of conflicts through traffic signals and only letting certain lanes travel at certain times. Uh, it's the classic model of locking. So readers do not block readers because it's quite possible for two things to read the same thing at the same time and not interfere with each other, but everything else blocks, right? Readers will block writers, writers will block readers and other writers. And again, this is, this is pessimistic. So we're, we're expecting these problems. Now, SQL Server has many different lock modes. Um, and these are essentially settings for the lock engine in SQL Server that will show whether locks are compatible with each other or not. And you can look this up in SQL Server documentation and you'll see a giant table like this. In fact, it's probably got a couple more rows because I believe there are more modes since I pulled this screenshot. Um, there's a whole bunch of lock modes. It can look very complicated. We're going to focus on only two types of locks in our talk today. We're going to talk about the S lock, which is the shared lock, which is more or less what is necessary to read something and the X lock or the exclusive lock, which is more or less what is necessary to write something in SQL Server. There's a whole bunch of other locks for different scenarios and for making lock situations more compatible. But the two big ones when you're talking about reading and writing are shared and exclusive locks. Locks exist in a hierarchy and to simplify, there's four levels of this hierarchy. There's a database, a table, a page, and a row. You can have locks at each level of this hierarchy. So if we're reading from a table, if we're issuing a select query, this lock hierarchy would, would look more or less like this. At the database level, our process would take a shared lock. In fact, all processes take a shared lock at the database level to essentially say that, hey, I'm in this database doing something don't mess with the database, don't drop the database while I'm still connected to it, things like that. Below the database level, at the table level, we would have what's called an intent lock and an intent shared lock, which means I'm doing something at a lower level. In this case, I'm sh using a shared lock at a lower level, so I have this intent shared lock that shows that. The page level is the same way, and then the row itself actually has a shared lock on it. So we have a shared lock on the database because we're in the database. We have a shared lock on the row because that's what we're reading. And the table and page both reflect through their intent locks that there are shared locks being taken at a lower level. If we were to write, we would look a little different. We'd still have a shared lock at the database level to say, hey, we're in the database. But the table and the page levels would now have intent exclusive or intent update locks. Okay, and the row itself would either have an exclusive lock or an update lock. And the idea is you need the exclusive lock to do the right, but it doesn't make sense to hold an exclusive lock while you're waiting to collect other locks. Let's say you're writing multiple rows and you need multiple exclusive locks. If you've acquired an exclusive lock on one row and you're still waiting on another, you're interfering with processes that could be going on on that row while you're waiting. So in SQL Server 2005, I believe, they introduced the concept of the update lock. And the idea of the update lock is to hold a place in line for an exclusive lock. Uh, and once all the necessary update locks have been acquired, they will be promoted to be exclusive locks. So we have our exclusive or our update lock at the row level. Again, the table and the page are showing the appropriate intent lock, showing what's going on below that level. 
and the shared lock is going on at the database level. This is a very simple example of how locks work in a hierarchy. And when we get into some of the demos and we see the actual locks that are being taken, this will make more sense. Now, the first isolation level we'll talk about is, is the simplest, and that's read uncommitted, right? And this is probably better known by its uh, synonym, which is no lock. Um, this effectively throws the concept of a transaction out the window. It basically allows anything to be read because it's not taking shared locks on the data while it's reading it. Um, as a result, you may read rows multiple times or you may read rows no time at all, right? And because of this, you may return a result that's never true. Uh, you'll see in the top right hand corner there, um, we have the different types of read phenomena and whether or not they are allowed. All are allowed in the read uncommitted model. So the dirty, non-repeatable and phantom reads are all possible. You'll see those change as we talk about other isolation levels. Another thing to remember about read uncommitted is it only applies to select queries. So if you're doing a data modification query, an insert, update, or delete, and you've specified no lock, that no lock is being ignored. Uh, there used to be a bug where it actually could cause index corruption if you did a modification query with no lock, but that was fixed long, long ago, so that's not a concern anymore. But if your, your employer or organization has a standard of we use no lock everywhere, well, I can 100% promise you that no lock does absolutely nothing unless it's a select query. And even then it may not be doing anything and it probably isn't helping you. Now, if I were to try to sum up the idea of the, the read uncommitted isolation level in a photo, it would be a time-lapse photo. And I have a time-lapse photo here of someone doing a break in pool, right? So we had the camera shutter open for a long period of time and we've captured something that never actually occurred at any one point in time, right? There's no point in time where the pool balls were all queued up ready to go and also flying around the table. We only captured this because we had a time-lapse photo going on. But in the same idea as no lock, because of this, this constraint or this lack of constraint, rather the lack of constraint of time, we've produced a picture of something that never actually occurred. Some myths about read uncommitted. The first myth is that no locks are taken when you use no lock. That's why they call it no lock, right? No, that's not correct, actually. All that means is that no shared locks are taken on the data while it's being read. There are still other types of locks that are being taken, uh, just like they would normally be. And the other myth is that it makes your queries faster. And this is, this is mostly wrong. Uh, if you have a query that has a lot of blocking on other select statements, then yes, this will help. Otherwise, it's probably doing you more harm than good by producing results that may or may not be correct. And with that, we'll get into our first demonstration here. Um, and I do have my demonstration database and all my code available for download. I'll have a link at the end. I'm gonna go ahead and pull over my script here. Um, and what I have is I have a database of all the zip codes, all the postal codes in the United States. Uh, it's a very simple database um, and I'm gonna restore it for each one. It's pretty small, so it should be fast. And just to show you what it has here, it is literally a table with only three columns and I hope it's big enough here, I'll use zoom it, but literally it has a column for the zip code and then the city and the state that that zip code corresponds to. And of course, some cities in, in our country are large enough, they have more than one zip code. So in that case, you'll have multiple entries, um, but the zip code column is unique. So that's what we have. So if we wanted to query our table and see how many cities in the United States are named Paris, we could do that very easily. And we would see here that, you know, there's a total of 15 zip codes assigned to cities named Paris in the United States. We can see that all from here. So to see dirty reads in action, I'm going to just run, a, run an update query. I'm going to run uh, an update and I'm going to set all the city names to Bob. Now I'm doing this within a transaction. So I'm going to begin a transaction and perform this update. I have not committed the transaction yet, so this query is still in flight. Uh, the problem with read uncommitted is if I were to open a new query window and say I'm going to select from my table with no lock, well, it's going to return the result that every city is named Bob, even though that hasn't been committed yet. If I were to run this query with no, uh, no lock specified, well, now it's going to block because we have a write waiting. Um, so that could be a problem, but that's where blocking on select is what no lock solves. We're gonna roll that back real quick. Um, now, if we wanna see exactly what locks are taken throughout the life of a query, we could do this with an extended event session. Hang on while I stop this, this other process here. 
do this through an extended event session. So I have an extended event session that will essentially just capture when a lock is acquired, right? And it's going to capture that for this session. So we're gonna go ahead and start this extended event session just to record the locks that are taken. Oops, I have a transaction running. Thought I rolled it back, sorry. There we go. All right, go ahead and kick this session off. Uh, I'm going to run the query again. I'm just gonna select all the zip codes with no lock. Uh, and now I'm going to alter the event session to flush it out so that we can query it better. And now I'm just going to go and take a look at what locks were taken during the course of this query running. Now, since it ran with no lock, there weren't a whole lot of locks, but there were some, right? We have, we have shared locks on a database um, and a schema stability lock being taken on the actual table object itself, the zip codes table. This schema stability lock is there to prevent someone from doing something to that table, like adding a column or dropping it while you're actively scanning it. That's what that involves. But otherwise, there's no shared locks taken on the data itself. And when we get to the read committed isolation level, you'll see the difference. But to show you that yes, there are in fact locks taken with a read uncommitted transaction, there you have your proof. All right, so that is the end of this demo. We'll get back to our slides here. Um, again, just to sum up read uncommitted, we're showing that you know it's not terrible, it exists for a reason, but you gotta make sure you understand the risks and the consequences associated with it. Next, we have read committed. This is the, as I said, the default default isolation level. It's the default for a database, and when you install, it's the default one that's set. Um, this builds on read uncommitted by giving us a guarantee, and you'll see in the upper right hand corner that dirty reads are not allowed. You have a guarantee that any data you read is will be committed, right? There's no dirty reads allowed here. So what we just did with read uncommitted is not possible with read committed, right? That's a good thing. Uh, there are no other guarantees provided other than that. Now the way read committed works is of course by locking, uh, but the way it takes its locks is it, as it reads a row, it acquires a lock on the row, it reads the row, and then it unlocks the row. The lock is only held for the duration of the read. So as you see in the picture here, as we're scanning along, we're literally going to each row and saying, lock this row, read it, unlock it, next row, lock it, read it, unlock it, and so on and so forth. So you have a lock being taken to ensure that the data is committed, but it's a very short held lock. Going back to our photography parallel for a moment, let's talk about what's called a swing lens camera, which I'm guessing unless you're very familiar with photography, you've probably never heard of. But this is a type of camera that has a lens that literally swings from side to side. It allows you to take a very wide panoramic photo. That's what one looks like. Here's a brief diagram of how it works. You have this lens that swings um, and it writes to a portion of the film at the time. We take pictures like this still, but now we do it with our smartphone in panoramic mode, right? So now we're swinging the entire phone instead of just the lens. The effect is the same though. We get a nice panoramic shot far wider than we could with just a stationary lens on its own. And these were very popular back in the day of you know actual cameras for taking wide pictures of things like school classes, which I know I had many photos taken like that. And there's one photo in particular I'm going to point out here, and this is, this is an actual class photo from my high school. It's not my class, so don't bother looking for me, but this was taken with a swing lens camera, and they always took this photo on graduation day. Now, the swing lens camera kind of works a lot like read committed, because the lock or the image that's being captured is a very short part as it moves across. So what you can do if you're someone particularly smart like this guy here is as the lens is swinging across, you can run to the other side and end up being in the picture twice. And notice how he has a nice little smirk on his face there. The other thing I'll point out very briefly is that uh, there's an 18 year old high school senior who apparently got into school wearing a shirt that says beer is food. And I don't think that would go today. But the idea here is that with read committed, the unlocked rows or the unlocked students can move at any time, right? Because they're unlocked. And this means you can swap rows around and you might get a case, in, uh, a case where a student or a row is read twice, or if this student had run in the other direction, they actually wouldn't have been in the picture at all, right? So now we're gonna go back to another demo and we're gonna talk about read committed a little bit. We're gonna restore a fresh copy of our database here. And now we're gonna add an index. We're just gonna add a unique index on the zip code column. And we're gonna do that so we can see some, some brief statistics of this index. 
So we're going to use sysdmdb index physical stats just to get the detailed statistics. We'll see it's a two level index. There's 41,437 rows in our table at the leaf level at index level zero. And there's one level above that with 98 records just because that's how the, the index was, was created. Now to see what kind of locks are taken while we run a read committed query, well, the first thing we're gonna do is just begin a transaction and, and read our rows, right? We'll begin a transaction and read our zip codes. Our transaction's still open. Now, if we were to query sysdm tran locks and see what locks are being held right now, even though this transaction is open, we're not gonna see anything. We're only gonna see that shared lock on the database because remember, these locks are not held for a long period of time. They're only held long enough to read the data. So we're going to roll back and now we're gonna do our extended event session again. Uh, we're gonna start an event, extended event session that will show when locks are acquired and released in this session. So we'll start that. Uh, we'll run our query, we'll alter our session to flush it out, and we'll look at the results. So now we have a whole bunch more data. In fact, we have 218 rows worth of data uh, because there's a lot of lock activity taking place here. Uh, but what I'm going to zoom in on and show you very quickly is here we have lock required, lock released for page 371. Lock acquired, lock released for page 372, 373. It's literally, as I described, going from page to page, locking it, reading it, unlocking it, and moving to the next one. That is the life of these locks in the read uncommitted mode. Now, because again, we can, we can move students around in our pictures and we can move rows around in our table while we're reading it and affect the results, Let's play a little game with that. So we know we have 41,437 rows. Uh, we saw that already. Which one's first? Well, it's number 00501, which happens to be the zip code for Holtzville, New York. And I only know that because of this session. Um, if we want to see the physical location of where this row is on disk, we can look. We can use the physical location formatter function. And we can see that it is on page 368 slot zero of file number one, which there only is one file here. That is the physical location of that row in this index. Now, if we change the value, if we change it from 00501 to 99999, we're changing the value, but we're also moving that row within the index. So if we use the same function again and run this again, we'll see that it's now on page 665 slot 115. Uh, and if we, we move it back to 00501 and do it again, we'll see that it's back where it started at row three, or page 368. So by changing the value, we're moving this row's location in the index. All right, so now what we're going to do, and I'm going to start this first, and then I'm going to describe it because it takes a little while. I'm going to start this process, and I'm going to start this next one, and then I will talk about them. What I'm doing here is I have a process running in this window which is taking that row and moving it back and forth. It's setting it to 99999 and then back to what it was. And then tonight we're doing that, we're saying go 5,000, we're doing it 5,000 times. So we're flipping this row's location within the index 5,000 times in one process. In this process here, we're counting the number of rows in the table, right? And we're counting it 1,000 times. So this is gonna take hopefully about 35 seconds, but we have these rows that are moving around like crazy and we're counting how many rows there are in the read committed isolation model. And hopefully this finishes really soon. It should. There we go. All right, so it took 43 seconds. Um, now, if we look at what we just captured, we're capturing the number of rows that it counted. And if we aggregate them, we'll see that 998 times out of 1,000, it got 41,436 rows, which is incorrect. It had one more. It only got the correct answer twice. Um, and this is a very skewed distribution. Normally when I run this, it'll, it'll actually get one more several times as well. Um, and it would be roughly 40% correct and 60% incorrect, 30 on each side. But either way, you're seeing here, we got the wrong answer just because this data was in flight in read committed while we were querying it. All right, so that's the end of, of this demo. Let's move back here to our slides. 
Uh, Bob, do you have time for a, for a question? I can uh, take a quick question, but I was, I was hoping to save them to the end, but sure, what is it? Oh, this one's a little bit longer, so I'll just save it for the end. Okay, I'm sorry. I just really want to cover this material. Absolutely, and I yeah. promise we'll, You're we'll good. get You've got questions. a lot of stuff to go through. Okay. <laughs> Keep yeah. trucking. Okay, cool. All right, so let's move to the next one. We got repeatable read here, and repeatable read builds on what we just saw in read committed. Um, and essentially, as you'll see at the top now, non-repeatable reads are, permit, are, are no longer allowed. Uh, if a query is repeated within the same transaction, records that are read the first time will not change. So once a row is read, that lock is held on that row for the length of the transaction. Even if a row was read and it didn't qualify as a result, the fact that it was read means we're holding on to that lock, right? This will prevent a lot of changes from occurring because once we read something, it can't change. Uh, but what it will not prevent is new rows being added, right? New, new rows still can be added. Those are the source of our phantom reads, which we'll see in a moment. Now, if I were to take a picture that kind of showed this, it would be like this, and this isn't the greatest picture, but it's essentially where a flash fires, so you see the toy car, uh, but the shutter stays open, so as the car is moving, you can kind of see the shadow of it moving across. Kind of the idea with repeatable read. To put it into my diagram here, we're reading, we're scanning across our rows, but now we're not unlocking them. Anything that's already been read is locked, and that lock is held. However, in subsequent scans, new rows may enter. So we may come across a row that had not yet been read and is therefore unlocked, and it will be locked once we've read it, right? Repeatable read doesn't see a whole lot of use uh, from my experience. Usually people are looking for either read, committed, or serializable. I don't see a whole lot of times when people use repeatable read, but it is an option, and we do have a brief demo for it. Um, so we're gonna go back here and use our repeatable read script and restore our database. Um, and we're just going to observe the row locking behavior. So I'm going to begin a transaction and I'm going to select all the rows, all the zip codes for cities in Illinois that start with the letter A, right? And this is, again, an open transaction. So now if I were to say, hey, what locks are being held by this transaction? Now we're going to get a whole bunch of locks that are being held. We have intent shared locks and we have actual shared locks on the rows themselves. So remember, before we ran this and we only saw the shared lock, we didn't see anything. Now these locks are being held and you can actually see that when you query the transaction locks. So we're going to roll that back and now we're going to play this same game again here. So we're going to have these rows moving across. Uh, it's a shorter version this time, don't worry. So we're going to have this rows, set them in motion, and we're going to go ahead and start counting them. And we're only going to count them a hundred times instead of a thousand times to save ourselves some, some effort that should complete and only a couple seconds here. But now remember, yeah, see it's done already. Now, because these locks are being held, we get the correct answer 100% of the time. We had 41,437 rows, that's what it's seeing. So we can no longer play shenanigans of not reading rows at all or reading them too many times because these locks are being held. Now, with all that being said, phantom rows still are possible. So if we were to go ahead, and I gotta stop this and kill this other process real quick here, go ahead and set our transaction level to repeatable read, and again, query the city names with the letter A. You'll notice there are 71 uh, cities beginning with the letter A in Illinois. Uh, and in another session, I were to insert a new value like this, now, when I go and run this query again within the same transaction, that new value will show up again, or that new value will show up for the first time. So now we have 72 rows. So we just injected a phantom row into our result set, even though this query was running, or this transaction was still open, and locks were being held. Uh, the locks did not prevent the, the introduction of a new row. Okay, so that's repeatable read. Uh, now let's move to serializable. Uh, and serializable keeps building, and now we have the stipulation that if a query is repeated within the same transaction, the results will be the same, right? This means that data we've seen previously will not change, and no new results will appear. Those phantom reads are no longer allowed. Uh, to accomplish this, we now need to lock data that does not yet exist. Um, and we could accomplish this by locking the entire table, but then we're affecting every other process. That's not a good way to do this. So a better way to accomplish this are with what are known as key range locks. And these will prevent phantom reads by defining a range and saying no other transaction can insert anything within this range. Um, and if you select something that doesn't exist, that gets locked too as part of the range. So if we have 
uh, our query running, now you'll see that everything is locked. Everything over the range being selected is locked. And also the first row outside of that range is also locked to prevent the introduction of anything sneaking in at the end. Um, if I were to define this as a picture, it would be a, a formal posed picture uh, where not a whole lot is changing. Like I have a photo here of the United States Supreme Court. I assume this photo was taken multiple times and didn't change because they were all standing still and no one was jumping in there. Same idea with a serializable query. We'll go to a serializable demo very quickly here uh, and restore our database. And we'll take a look at the row locking behavior in the serializable isolation mode now. So we're gonna go ahead and create a unique index. Uh, and we're going to select all the zip codes for a city uh, where the zip code starts with 1051. Now there can be up to eight. Um, in this case, there's a, or there can be up to 10. There's only eight in this case. But this transaction is still open. If we were to go ahead and look at the locks that are being held by it, and I, I'm filtering on key locks, what we have are these key range locks now that are being held that we haven't seen before. So we'll see it's a range shared shared lock uh, and there's nine of them we returned eight rows we are locking the range for all each of the eight rows and the one beyond it to prevent anything else from being inserted into uh, our result set so that is how the serializable isolation level works so that concludes pessimistic concurrency now let's go to optimistic concurrency um, and optimistic concurrency is a lot like the idea of a traffic circle so instead of having a traffic light now we've introduced something different where we don't have specific stop times we have we have a better formula where hopefully traffic can manage itself with fewer conflicts and in a lot of traffic circles you might not even have to stop before you enter them um, so you can have a lot more freedom and, and typically get better performance um, so this uses row versioning to prevent concurrency conflicts and fewer locks are needed, so blocking is reduced. Um, readers no longer block writers and writers no longer block readers, uh, but writers do still block readers. And this is all accomplished with a version store which lives in tempdb. This, again, this does not prevent conflict and it does not prevent locking, but it helps reduce it greatly. Now to talk very briefly about the version store, the idea is the version store is kind of like a linked list. You have a list of versions of each row and whenever a row is updated, a new version is added and the previous version is stored in this version store. Um, this list is held or as many versions are held in this list as are necessary to satisfy the longest running query. So if we have a query running and we have a version of a row like row number six has a value of four, maybe it had a previous version uh, where the value was seven at a previous time point, and it had an older version than that at a, at a even further back in the distance time point. This may be kind of hard to visualize, so instead of using uh, a table, I'm having blocks. I'm using, pretend we have a database table where the type is a colored wood block. We have three rows in this table. You can see the three rows on the screen, and you'll notice how each version points to a previous version and there's a timestamp. That's what that T equals number is for each value. So the current state of this table is this. It's rows number um, where the time is, is not five or later on this or nine or later actually. And what you'd see is what's on the right. So the current state of this table is the green ball, the blue block and the red block. Um, if we were to look back at a previous point in time, maybe at time equals seven, we would see this, that would be the state of our table and those, those versions that involve time point number nine haven't occurred yet according to this state. And if we went further back to say time equals four, uh, the version store would return this. So you have different versions of each of the rows in a table for different periods of time. That is what's used by optimistic concurrency. So if we go to our first optimistic concurrency level or isolation level here of read committed snapshot, this gives you the same guarantees as read committed, but it uh, has an optimistic implementation of it. So it doesn't allow dirty reads, non-repeatable and phantom reads can still occur though. Um, and what this is, is this is statement level snapshot isolation. So when you run a query, the query will see whatever version will show the most recent values as of the beginning of that statement, not the transaction. That's important to point out. So if you start a transaction and have multiple statements within that transaction and you're using read committed snapshot, each one of those statements might see a different version depending on what they're looking at and what has changed. Um, but overall, you will get the effect of read committed. So to go back to our block example very quickly here, um, let's say I have 
this particular state at time equals seven. We have the colored blocks, uh, we have the red half moon and the red square, the red rectangle there. When the statement starts executing, it sees this version. It's working with what it sees on the right. Now pretend while our statement is executing and reading through those rows, new rows or the rows are changed, right? We have an update that occurs. In this particular case, we added new versions to the version store. Now this update can occur without blocking because there weren't any locks taken, right? So, so it's not blocked by the fact that the data is being read because the version store is being used. And what's being read in the version store isn't blocked either because it doesn't need to be. So our statement will continue to see the same version and other update uh, operations can occur. It's pretty nice. So for read committed snapshot to work, you actually have to enable it with specific syntax in your database. You gotta say alter database set read committed snapshot on and enabling read committed snapshot is a blocking operation. So you kind of have to choose whether or not you wanna implement this command with no wait and prevent the blocking and just have your operation fail or you can use rollback immediate and that will roll back everybody else's transaction to uh, enable read committed snapshot. When I used to deploy this at clients, we would often wait till, you know, a quieter period in the evening or perhaps a planned downtime to enable read committed snapshot because it does have to kick everybody out of the database very briefly uh, to start the version store. But other than that, it's pretty smooth sailing when you're using read committed snapshot. Uh, we have a demo of how that works very quickly here. So I'm going to go ahead and restore my database and then enable read committed snapshot. Fortunately, I have nothing running. Now let's look at our reads repeatable in it. Um, so I'm gonna select a different city now, a city called Hoopston, Illinois, because there's only one zip code in Hoopston, so that makes things a little easy. Um, and in this session, I'm gonna begin a transaction and I'm gonna update their zip code to 99999. So I'm gonna update it. Again, this is an open transaction, so it has not been committed yet. In another session, I'm going to uh, begin a transaction and I'm going to query the value. Now it's seeing the old correct zip code value. It's not seeing the new one because that transaction has not committed yet over here, right? So now over here, we're gonna commit our change. Now, if we rerun this query over in our other session, even though the transaction is still open, we get the new value, right? This is because, um, we're not doing any kind of transaction level isolation. It's statement level isolation. We're seeing the state as of when the statement began running. It doesn't care about the transaction. So this is exactly as we would plan it to operate. So now that we've done that, we're gonna set it back and we're going to um, play our little row moving game again here. So in another session, we're gonna go ahead and get these rows moving around 5,000 times. Uh, while over here, we're going to set no count on and start counting the number of rows. And this should complete rather quickly at this point. There we go, it's already done. All right, so now if we see our results, we have the correct result again every time because every time that statement starts executing to count the rows, it's seeing a snapshot and is not being affected by any of these other changes. So that's our RCSI demo and we're almost done. We're in the home switch. So now we have snapshot isolation and snapshot isolation is kind of like the big kahuna. It gives you all the guarantees of serializable, uh, no dirty reads, no non-repeatable reads, no phantom reads, uh, but it gives you an optimistic implementation of them. And this is true transaction level snapshot isolation. So your queries will see the most recent data committed as of the beginning of that transaction, not the statement anymore. Um, and if you just say begin tran, that isn't good enough. You have to say begin tran and actually do something. So begin tran and select or begin tran and update. But from that point forward, your query will have a consistent view uh, of a version. Now to turn this on, there's two steps necessary. Uh, you have to alter the database and set allow snapshot isolation on. This will actually allow the snapshot isolation. It'll, it'll turn on the version store in effect. And then in any particular session you wanna use it for, you have to say set transaction isolation level to snapshot. So you gotta, you gotta not only turn the version store on, you gotta say, hey, I'm using snapshot isolation. Um, and snapshot isolation also comes with a catch. It comes with this uh, idea of update conflicts, which unfortunately can occur. So 
here's the scenario and we'll see it again in a demo momentarily. But if we have a process that's reading data in a transaction and does not commit, uh, that process now has its own version because, because snapshot isolation says so. And then process two comes along and reads and updates the same data and commits its update or doesn't commit it, but reads and updates it. Now we have the problem of we have two different versions that different processes see because remember it's at the transaction level. So the, the snapshot that was taken by process one doesn't know about process two's update. Um, if process one tries to update the same rows itself, it's going to get blocked because process two already has an update in flight. Remember, writers still block writers and that's exactly what's happening here. And then here's the real catch. As soon as process two commits, process one will actually fail with an error for an update conflict. That's error number 3960. Um, so let's go back to our demo and we'll see that in action here. We'll play with snapshot isolation just a tiny bit. So we'll go ahead and we'll restore our database. Uh, and then we'll turn snapshot isolation on and enable it for our session. So we're gonna play that same game that we played before, not with moving things around, but with making changes in different sessions. So we're gonna mess with Hoopston again. Uh, we're gonna begin a transaction and we're gonna update their zip codes to 99999. Uh, and then in another session, we're going to set transaction isolation to snapshot and just read the value in. Now, even though this session, the other session has a transaction in flight, this session doesn't know about it, right? It's, it's isolated and it's seeing the old value because the new one hasn't committed yet. But what if it commits? So we're gonna commit our change. And now over here, we'll see that our, our value is in fact 99999. But what if we go over to our other session and we run this query again, what are we gonna see? We're still going to see the old value because the snapshot that this transaction is seeing has not changed yet. Remember, the transaction is still open. Now, as soon as we commit the transaction in this session, even though we made no changes, we commit it, we end the transaction. Now, if we run this query again, we'll actually see the newly updated value of 99999. Uh, but the fact that we have a, a open transaction is holding our results for us. I'm gonna go ahead and commit out of this transaction and we're gonna play one more thing here uh, and just see a snapshot update conflict very quickly. So I'm going to begin a transaction and I'm going to select uh, the city of Riverside, Illinois, uh, which produces one row. And remember we've created a version because we, we opened a transaction and selected something. And in the other session, we're going to begin a transaction and update Riverside zip code. We're gonna update it to 99998. So we've done that. Now in this session, if I try to update that row, remember my session doesn't know the other one made this change, but it's not gonna be able to update that row. In fact, it's gonna block, right? We haven't seen a whole lot of blocking lately, but I have a, a spinning execute query down at the bottom here, even though Zoomit freezes it. Uh, it's blocked because this other session has an update of the same rows that this session doesn't know about until it tried to execute. Now, if I take my second session, which has the update in flight, and I commit it, that will instantly kill my update request in the other session, and it'll give you error 3960, transaction aborted due to an update conflict. So you can have conflicts in snapshot isolation that you won't have in read committed snapshot, but if you need the transaction level isolation, that's the way to go. So those are all the isolation levels and we still have a little time left, which is good because we have just a few more slides here. Uh, the first thing I like to address is Azure SQL database in the cloud. Uh, absolutely everything we talked about here today matters in Azure SQL database. So everything you saw works on premises or in the cloud, it's the same database engine, works the same way. Uh, the one exception is that if you create a database in Azure SQL database, read committed snapshot isolation is enabled by default. So instead of read committed, uh, regular, you get read committed snapshot isolation. That's the only difference. And finally, now that we talked about all these isolation levels and these locking and this blocking, uh, we're gonna go to our final point here and have an incredibly brief touch on in-memory OLTP. Uh, in-memory in OLTP is an incredibly complex topic that could very well be its own presentation and I am nowhere near doing it justice, but I'm just trying to show how it's different. 
Uh, so what it involves, and this was introduced in SQL Server 2014, I believe, uh, is it uses what's called optimistic multi-version concurrency control. Uh, there are no locks required at any time, not even for data modification, and as such, there's no waiting because of blocking because there's no locks to cause blocking. Uh, there's also no latches or spin locks either. And now you can still get weights. There still could be waiting on things like writing to disk or network, but there's no locks that are going to occur or no blocks that are going to occur as a result of locking because there just is no locking. Now, how do they get away with no locking? Uh, they do that by never modifying any existing row. So any type of update operation creates a new version of a row every single time. Uh, this means you may have multiple versions of a row in play at once and when a transaction is running or is already in flight, it needs to be presented with the correct versions of rows to maintain a consistent view of whatever it's looking at. But because of this constant creation of new versions of rows, there's no need to lock anything. Now to illustrate this very, very briefly, uh, let's say I have a table here that has two columns um, and those columns are actually on the right here. So we have two rows and two columns, we have a number, uh, one and three and a color red and green. So each, each row has those two columns. Um, we're also appending to that row a beginning time and an ending time. Um, so both of these rows were created at time 10. They're effectively assigned a begin time of 10. And because they're the current row, they have an infinite end time. They have no, no ending time at all. So this is what's in effect at time 10. Now let's say we wanna make a change uh, forward in time a little bit. So at time 20, we're gonna delete the row that's one red. Uh, we're gonna update three green to three blue and we're gonna insert six pink. That would result in the following changes and now our, our sets of row versions would look like this. Our row for one red, which is deleted, well, that now gets an end time assigned to it. So it's now begin at 10, end at 20. That is effectively the time that this row was in effect. Uh, the three green is actually going to have an end time of 20 and three blue, the new version is going to be beginning at time 20 and ending at infinite because it's still in effect. And six pink is going to um, be inserted with a begin time of 20. So all we did here was create new rows. Um, and then depending on what time our transaction started, we can calculate which rows are actually visible. And that's effectively how you achieve concurrency uh, in, in memory OLTP uh, that has been grossly simplified. Um, so that more or less concludes this presentation. Uh, some great resources if you want to learn more about uh, transaction isolation levels. Craig Friedman at Microsoft has some great blog posts all about it. Uh, Kaylin Delaney wrote a book on SQL Server concurrency that is that is awesome reading uh, for any skill level. I, I like to think anyone can read that book and read something. And also Klaus Aschenbrenner has um, some good blog posts on myths and misconceptions about transaction isolation levels. Um, if we have any questions, I'm more than happy to take them with the time we have left. I also have at the bottom of this slide highlighted in yellow, uh, that URL will take you to my GitHub where you can get my slides, my code, and that zip code database if you want to play. So everything's available from that URL.